So, dang it. Oh man, looks like If you would, John chapter 18. I'm going to give you some principles of justice, and I'm just going to go quickly through these. Principle number one is that police are not saints that are above the law. You can't just automatically believe them. But yet today, I've sat and watched where in a jury selection process, the judge asked the jury, would you automatically assume that a policeman is telling the truth and would you give more weight to his testimony than that of someone else? And they said, oh, of course. I mean, we're taught to trust our, our, our police officers. They're, they're public servants. They love us. And I mean, that's what most people, they'll just automatically be. Therefore, if a policeman says this person did it or this evidence there, they'll just automatically believe it as gospel. That is not biblical according to the Bible. Right. Which leads me to number two. So number one is to realize that police are not saints that are above the law or above sin, despite what your Baptist church has been telling you your whole life, parading them across the platform. But number two, important principle, just because someone is arrested does not mean that they're automatically guilty. But this is how we think in our society today. We need to know some basic principles of justice. But number two, it's that just because someone is accused or just because someone is arrested, that doesn't make them guilty. Look at John chapter 18 and see this mentality in the Bible. Verse 28, Then led they, Jesus, from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? You got to love this answer from the Jews here in verse 30. They answered and said unto him, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. <laughs> so they asked, well, what's the charge? What is he being charged with? Look, if he weren't a bad guy, we wouldn't have arrested him. You know, what's the charge? Why does that matter? So you see the mentality here of just, well, if he's been arrested, if you're being brought before the judge, if you go to court, you're already presumed guilty by most people. Now in America, we supposedly have the presumption of innocence. You're supposed to be innocent until you're proven guilty. But de facto, in people's minds these days, we just think that you're, you're presumed guilty and you have to prove your innocence. Which is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. Go to Deuteronomy 19. Why is this important? Because the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.1, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come and he lists off the different things about these perilous times and he says it'll be a time in verse 3 of false accusers yeah. the bible says that in the last days one of the characteristics of the last days is false accusers also what does the bible say in matthew 24 about the last days the brother will deliver up the brother to death the father of the child the children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death matthew 24 so there is an end times phenomenon, the Bible says, where people are false accusers. It's not just perilous times, meaning, oh, you walk down the street and it's dangerous. No, it could be perilous times of being accused of crimes that you didn't commit. Yeah. Thrown into prison or worse because of crimes that you didn't even commit. False accusers are out there. How do we prevent people from being falsely condemned? I mean, look, don't you think that a person who serves God is going to be falsely accused when the Bible says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution? Yeah. Don't you think a big part of that is false accusations? I'll say this. Every pastor of every church I've ever gone to was falsely accused at some point or multiple times. Why? Because all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you know what? Even if you're not a pastor, just if you're a Christian, there's a good chance that you're going to receive false accusations leveled against you at some point in your life, whether that be at your job, your school, in your family, in the church, whatever. This is part of life. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 19. The Bible reads in verse 15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. 
And behold, if the witness be a false witness and have testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. Now, this is a pretty strong punishment. It says that if you falsely accuse someone, your punishment is whatever their punishment would have been. So if you accuse someone of murder and you falsely accuse them and you testify falsely, you know, you go in there and you give your oath or affirmation and you say, I'm going to tell the whole truth. And then you sit there and lie under oath in order to get that person convicted. And it's found out that you're a false witness. The Bible says that you would be put to death yeah. or what? Or let's say it was about stealing and the punishment was to pay $2,000. Well, now you pay the $2,000. Whatever the punishment was. Look what the Bible says. Verse 19, that, sh that shall you do unto him, then shall you do unto him, as he had thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. He's saying he'll scare people to where they won't commit false witness. They won't bear false witness against their neighbor. Watch this. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. What's he saying? He's saying, look, if someone lies about evidence, if someone lies about evidence and says, hey, I found this evidence or this is what I saw, in order to falsely accuse someone of murder, that person should be killed. He said, life shall go for life. Don't pity. Because you might think, well, he didn't kill anybody. All he did was plant evidence. All that officer did was just plant evidence or all that guy did was just lie under oath. He's not worthy of death, but what does the Bible say? Don't pity. Life has to go for life. Why? Because he said others need to hear and fear. Otherwise, the false accusations are going to be rampant. Yeah. There's going to be a constant planting of evidence. There's going to be a constant lying under oath. Why? Because that's the nature of man. And so God says, in order to prevent people from being condemned unjustly, you have to make sure that it's not just one guy whose testimony you're believing. At the mouth of one witness, you know, that's not a, It has to be two or three witnesses. And if one is found to be a false witness, they shall be punished with whatever the punishment was. If they were going to put a guy, if our justice system followed this, that means if they were going to give a guy 20 years in prison and, you know, it's found that actually this guy lied under oath, the guy was innocent, they lied, he goes to prison for 20 years. Not, oh, he gets a two-week suspension. Oh, he got a reprimand. I mean, that's the kind of things that'll be today. Or it's just a misdemeanor. He perjury, committed perjury. No, 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 it should be whatever the punishment was that he's trying to put on someone else. That's what the Bible clearly says. So, I gotta hurry up, I'm almost out of time here. Number one, we said police are not saints. They're not above the law. They're not sinless. You can't just automatically believe them. Number two, just because someone gets arrested doesn't mean that they're automatically guilty. Just because someone is accused of something doesn't mean they're automatically guilty. Number three, two or three witnesses are necessary to condemn someone. You can't just go one person's word. If it's their word against yours, if it's just two people only, there's no physical evidence, there's no video recording or pictures or, you know, and, and even those things sometimes have to be taken with a grain of salt in the day we're living in when you can fabricate video and picture and everything. But you know, you can't just take one person's testimony and just condemn someone. It's at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So if there's a doubt where it's, well, it's just your word against theirs, then you rule not guilty. Hello? When in doubt, it's not guilty. Because that, and that's the way our justice system is supposed to work. You're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty beyond doubt beyond a reasonable doubt, saying, you know, not just a doubt like, well, I guess, I mean, it's possible that they might not have done it if aliens landed or whatever. But honestly, <laughs> it's beyond a reasonable doubt where, where, where any reasonable person would say, you know what, this person did it, period. But if you're like, man, I don't know. I just don't know if they did it. And this is also good preaching for you to hear if you're ever going on a jury, by the way. Yeah, right. If you're on a jury and you're sitting there like, man, I just don't know. I don't know if they did it, then it's not guilty. Let God deal with that person. But you can't just sit there and just condemn people when it's really questionable. So two or three witnesses are necessary to condemn.